So what would be the properties of perfect computer memory? Well, of course, it should have unlimited capacity. No matter how much data we want to store on that computer memory, there would always be some space left for even more data. The second property should be instant random access. So no matter which address we want to access, be it for reading or for writing, there shouldn't be any latency, no latency at all. We would have instant access to whatever data at any position. The third property should be unlimited bandwidth. So we should be able to stream arbitrary amounts of data to any position or from any position to the central processing unit. The fourth property should be, it's for free of course, we don't want to pay anything for this kind of memory. And the fifth is this memory should be persistent at all times. So whether we switch off electricity or whatever happens to the memory, the memory should never ever lose the data. Those should be the five properties of perfect computer memory. Well, obviously this doesn't exist. This would be infeasible to build. Therefore, people came up with a compromise and that compromise is the storage hierarchy, also referred to as a memory hierarchy. That's another term for it, memory hierarchy. And it basically looks like that. So you have in the center, the core or the CPU, so differentiation doesn't matter for the moment. So this is basically the CPU. This contains all the arithmetic logical units, all the computational power sits in that space. Well, and there are a couple of registers that is the memory the CPU actually can operate on directly. And then there are a number of levels or layers. Those are all different types of storage media with different devices. And a major property that's usually implemented is whatever data sits in L1 is also included in L2. So whatever sits in L2 is included in L3. This is called the inclusion property. Inclusion. So this means that L1 contains a subset of L2, contains a subset of L3, contains a subset of main memory, and so forth. That's the inclusion property. There are some machines that don't require that at all times, but usually you have that inclusion property. So the major properties in a storage hierarchy are depicted here on the left and on the right. So let's start with the left. So what this means is the further you go away from the core, from the central processing unit, the higher the capacity of the different layers. So L3 is bigger than L1. Main memory is bigger than L3, hard disk is bigger than main memory. Usually, yeah, that doesn't have to be like that, but usually in 99% of the cases it's like that. The second property is that the access time increases. So for random access, you can access L1 way faster than you can access L2 and, and so on. So L3 is slower then L2, my memory is slower than L3 and so forth. So the further you go away, the slower the random access, the access time. On the other hand, and that's depicted with the arrow on the right, you see that the closer you get to the CPU, to the core, the more expensive the specific computer memory becomes. So it's more expensive to build L1 than it is to build my memory, if you count it per byte, of course. Yeah? And the same holds here, so main memory is way more expensive than hard disk memory. Always counted with respect to the number of bytes that memory can store. And the fourth property is bandwidth. So bandwidth refers to streaming a large portion of the data at a time to a different medium. So for example, consider you want to stream 100 megabytes of data from main memory to the core. It's way faster to stream 100 megabytes of memory from L2 to the core than it is from main memory to the core. Those are the four major properties. Capacity increases the further you go away from the core. Access time increases, meaning random access gets slower the further you go away from the core. On the other hand, memory gets more expensive the closer you get to the core. And bandwidth increases the closer you get to the core. The major property is if you find, whenever you look up data, whenever you access data, you first check whether it's in the register. If it's not there, you check L1. If it's not there, you check L2. 
If it's not there, you check L3 and so forth. So whenever the core needs to access some data, needs to work on some data, it will try to find that data in one of the closer storage levels. And only if it's not there, it will go one step to the outside, one step away from the core and try whether it's there. This means that we will see later on, and we will look at that in more detail, of course, that whenever you're lucky and find data item here, you don't have to go to L2 or L3 because it was already there. So in many situations, this kind of storage hierarchy masks the slowness. This storage hierarchy hides the slowness of those devices. So as you want to have very fast access and at the same time a super high capacity at the same time, which is unfeasible to build, in the storage hierarchy, you will see that you very often have both properties. As a lot of the data that you're accessing, a lot of the data you're working with is cached in the fast levels of the hierarchy. Okay, so let's look at typical access times in that hierarchy. So if you want to access anything in your core and it's in one of the registers, well, this takes only one computing cycle to access. That's the fastest thing you can access in the machine. If it's not in the registers and first has to be loaded from L1 to a register, this takes four cycles. So in this four cycles, you have to wait till the data gets available in the registers. So you're losing four cycles. That's one way of seeing that. If the data is not there, if the right data you want to work with is not there, you're losing four cycles. And then the further you go out, the higher those access times. So if it's not in the registers, not in L1, you have to wait 10 cycles to have the data available in order to be able to work with the data. And then if it's not in those caches, but only in L3, you have to wait 60 cycles and so forth. So those times may not hurt so much if this ha happens only a single time, but if for millions and zillions of operations, you always have to wait for the right data to come in, those access times that we're also calling access latency, latencies, or access latencies. Yeah, these access latencies may add up pretty quickly, especially when it comes to fetching data from main memory or fetching data from hard disk. So here you see, you have 60 nanoseconds to fetch data from main memory. And here you have five milliseconds. This is a huge amount of time compared to the clock speed of a modern CPU. So five milliseconds to fetch the data if it's not in any of those storage levels in the middle. And that's something you really have to keep in mind. When you show the storage hierarchy like that, the differences of the different access times is kind of lost. It's really important to understand about those relative distances. That is what matters in the end, right? Okay, let's take a look at the relative distances. And um, so I'm using an analogy that I found on the web uh, and I give reference at the end of the video. But, but the idea is as follows. Assume L1 ca cache is like grabbing a piece of paper from your desk. Uh, assume it takes two seconds. So the four cycles the computer system takes to fetch data from L1 is now set to two seconds. And that's like fetching a piece of paper from your desk. So how long does it then take to fetch something from L2? Well, L2 is like picking up a book from a nearby shelf. Maybe you have to get up from your chair, get it into your hand and then go back to your chair. That's like five seconds. And that's already a difference of factor 2.5. So what about L3? L3 is like picking up a book from the next room. This is like 30 seconds or a factor 15 difference. What about main memory? What about DRAM? Well, DRAM is taking a walk down the hall to buy a Twix bar and that's 90 seconds or a factor 45 difference to L1 cache. And then the interesting question of course is what about hard disk? If the data is not available in the caches, if it's not available, in my memory, but only on disk, we have to fetch it from disk. What is the difference there? 
Well, that's actually like walking from Saarland, from Germany, to Hawaii. Or 7,500,000 seconds of walking. So 86.8 days, basically. This is a difference of a factor of 3,750,000 over fetching it from L1 directly. Well, that's a huge difference. And yeah, this analogy just visualizes a little bit those extreme differences in the different levels. So keep that in mind. Let's look at another aspect here that is the capacity. So the capacity usually looks something like that. So this is based on an Intel Xeon architecture. The number of registers depends on the instruction set being used. So here the discussion is based on x86-64. In such a machine you have 16 registers of 8 byte each, so 64 bits has a register. You can load it fully with data, you can also load it partially, whatever you want. In addition to that you have wider registers. Those registers have a length of 32 bytes. Those registers are also called SIMD registers, single instruction, multiple data. And we will come back to that later on. This can be used for very interesting operations, very efficient operations for data processing. It was mainly introduced for graphics eventually a long time ago for a Pentium processor, but now it can also be used very well for data processing. Then the L1 has a size of 32 kilobytes, then L2 256 kilobytes typically, then you have 8 megabytes for L3. And then usually today, as of the recording of this video in 2013, you have 16 gigabytes of main memory or even bigger. So this can be changed in any way you want, but that's a typical size these days. And then a typical machine has two terabytes of hard disk. That's one disk. Huh? You can put that on one disk th these days. Of course, these parameters may vary a bit. Huh? Depends on the concrete CPU you're using. Well, and here again, this visualization with the storage hierarchy is somewhat misleading because these sizes differ a lot. Therefore, I'm again using a different visualization and that looks as follows. So here I depicted the sizes of the different levels in the storage hierarchy using relative areas. So here you can see the area of L1 is something like that and in comparison the area of L2 is eight times bigger. And the, the difference from L1 to L3 is a factor 256 but the difference from L1 to DRAM is a factor of half a million actually. So you can't even see that this is a disk anymore. This is such a huge difference. And you don't see that if you depict it like that. Here it really feels like, well, man, memory is a little bigger than L3, right? Maybe a factor two or something. But that's not true. It's a huge difference, a huge difference in size, not only access time, but also size between DRAM and L3. So only if you zoom out, you will be able to see that DRAM is also kind of a disk, yeah? And it is a huge difference in terms of size over L3, L2, and L1. We're not talking about the registers here. So, what are the tasks of each level in this storage hierarchy? They all have very similar tasks, actually. So they have to localize data objects, have to find the stuff. So there has to be a way to, to find data in that storage level. They're caching data from lower levels of the hierarchy. That's called inclusion, as explained above. This usually holds in most of the architectures I'm aware of, but you can also bypass that in certain architectures. You have to have data replacement strategies, meaning if you don't have space anymore on a particular level, you have to kick out some data to make room for new data. And how this is done is defined by the data replacement strategy. We will look at that in more detail later on because it has a huge impact on the performance of your system. Another important property that has to be handled is writing modified data. So let's assume again you have two layers in that hierarchy. Let's say you have L3. Yeah, let's make it like that. So this is L3. And we have main memory, something like that, right? Okay. Okay, and you have a data item you load from main memory into L3. Let's say this data item is called A. So A is loaded into L3. Now it's in L3 as a copy, it's the inclusion property. But then it's modified from the CPU. 
and now it becomes A prime. This is a changed version of A prime. So eventually you need to write A prime back to main memory and maybe then you need to write it back to hard disk or tape. Here you basically have two different strategies. First is write through. So write through means that immediately when A got changed to A prime, you write it back to main memory. You write back the changed item to main memory. That is write through, immediate writing of the data back to main memory. The other option is write back. Write back means you don't write it back immediately, but you wait till this element is thrown out of L3 due to replacement, due to data replacement. Don't worry, we will look at that in more detail, but for the moment there are those two strategies and you have to make a decision whether you immediately write change data down to lower levels or whether you wait till the data gets replaced in this level here and then this is a write back strategy. But anyway, all these properties are super similar for all levels of the hierarchy. And that is why this leads to a so-called pattern. So I'm calling this the all levels are equal pattern. And what I mean by that, I will explain in my next video. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Dit, or you look at our website infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there.